This is March the 20th, and we are in session 21 of the book of Revelation. We're going to start in Revelation chapter 13, verse 16, and on page 65 of the notes. That was the last page of the notes that were given uh, last time. And uh, I'm, do, you, do you have the notes from last time? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, since we had two weeks we've been away, I think we more than ever need to kind of review to find out where we are in our study. Uh, in this section of the book of Revelation that we're studying, which is the heart of the book, we're studying the prophecy concerning the coming tribulation period. The tribulation period is a period of of seven years, it's divided into two halves. First three and a half is certainly tribulation, but the second three and a half is called the Great Tribulation for very good reason. Um, so chapter four to 19 deal with the tribulation. I thought uh, what I would do to review is just take us through the points of the outline uh, because um, we're going to get to point number 10 tonight and um, or actually point number nine and I, I got to thinking you know uh, there are so many points in between that it's kind of hard to uh, to just lose focus on what the whole picture is so just to kind of review that uh, number one was the throne in heaven. That was in chapter 4. Uh, number two was the scroll in heaven. That was chapter 5. So the section on the tribulation begins with the scene in heaven. What's going on in heaven? We, we've had time to see the uh, presence of God uh, in the throne. And then there was this scroll and... Ron, uh, you'll need the notes from last time. We are, when we're going to be on page 65 there. And then these are new notes that start tonight. So we started with the throne in heaven, then the scroll in heaven, chapter 5. Then chapter 6, we got into the seal judgments. Those seven seals, each one was broken, uh, un unveiling uh, events of the tribulation. Then number four, there was an interlude uh, between uh, the end of the breaking of the seals and the blowing of seven trumpets. There was an interlude where we came to meet some believers. Uh, first of all, we met the, the redeemed of the tribulation in that there were 144,000 Jewish people who, when the tribulation begins, God is going to open their eyes to the truth of salvation. They're going to believe in Christ and they're going to be sealed. That is, they're going to be protected uh, from, from being killed during the period of the tribulation. And they're going to be witnesses taking the gospel around the world. And so in this interlude, we meet these 144,000 Jewish, they become evangelists. And then we meet a big multitude of Gentiles who come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now most of them are martyred, but praise God for this great, uh, great amount of, of people that come to faith uh, through the testimony of the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Then we had point number five, which is the six trumpet judgments. That was in chapters eight and nine. Each one of those trumpets, when it is blown, uh, it reveals to us another uh, tr trial and tribulation that's coming during the tribulation. Then point number six, there was the little scroll in chapter 10. That is a further description of the scroll that was in chapter 5. This scroll is the title deed to the earth. And this scroll belongs to the Lord. And he is the one who owns the title deed to the earth. And he can do with this earth uh, what he pleases. <coughs> then number 7, we met the two witnesses. 
there are going to be two witnesses who are going to appear on the scene who are going to be very dramatic and uh, there's been lots of speculation that one might be Elijah come back and one might be Moses come back and so on another view is that they would be normal regular people um, got a lot of division on viewpoints on that they're going to they're going to have miraculous power that God's going to give them and uh, th their their testimony is going to go out throughout the world and the world is going to get mad at them because of their faith in the Lord they're going to be killed the world's going to rejoice at that uh, their bodies are going to be lying in Jerusalem for uh, for the whole world to see and of course today we know that's possible because of satellite television that the whole world's going to see those bodies in Jerusalem <coughs> And then all of a sudden, while the cameras are on them, they're going to come to, to life and they're going to be raised from the dead. And uh, again, it's a testimony of God to the unbelieving world of who God is and his power. Then there was number eight, which was war, war on this earth like there has not never been, as well as chapter 12 also shows us war in heaven with Satan against God. That brings us to number nine, where we, where we currently are, the beast and his false prophet, and that's in chapter 13. Now, the beast is the title in the book of Revelation for the Antichrist. The Antichrist is never called the Antichrist in Revelation. He's called the Antichrist in the book of 1 John, uh, Thessalonians, and so on, but never in the book of Revelation. He's called the beast. And the idea of the beast is something ferocious and awful, something you don't want contact with, and so on. And it's a good, it's a good picture of, of the Antichrist and uh, what he will do. That's in chapter 13, verses 1 to 10. Then, last time, we got into the prophecy of the false prophet. And that's in chapter 13, verses 11 to 18. <coughs> the false prophet is the assistant to the Antichrist. And the false prophet, his, his desire is to bring the whole world into worship and uh, obedience uh, to the Antichrist. And uh, in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 13, we saw the description of the false prophet last time. Last time we then saw verses 13 and 15, the deception of the false prophet. And let's read that, even though we studied it last time, just to, just to get into the flow uh, of the chapter. So chapter 13 verse 13, so 13, 13, it, so that is this false prophet, and he's described as a beast also, so that's why the word it is used. It performs great signs. Um, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan performs signs. Uh, he has power. He does not have God's power. He does not have omnipotence all power but he does have some power and he has some good tricks up his sleeve and he can be very deceptive and he can set things up to just appear uh, to be even more miraculous uh, than they really are and so a false prophet is given this power by Satan he even makes fire come down from heaven to the earth in front of the people and by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, which is the Antichrist, <coughs> it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And so he, he directs in uh, making this image of the Antichrist for people to actually worship. And then when it refers to this image of the beast uh, that was slain and so on, uh, one of the things that will happen to the Antichrist is, is an apparent uh, uh, assassination attempt, and he's, he's going to appear to be dead and then come to life. We've seen that uh, in previous study. And so Antichrist just kind of fans the flame of that and say, oh, wow, look at this. And this is someone to be worshipped and, and so on. 
<coughs> and that image is going to be set up in the Jewish temple in Jerusalem uh, for people to worship the Antichrist. Well, that gets us ready then to the new material for tonight, which is on page 65, and that is number three, the demand of the false prophet, and that's in verses uh, 16 through 18. So, uh, Revelation 13, verse 16, the demand of the false prophet. Look at verse 16, and it, referring to the false prophet, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the full forehead. So the false prophet as this assistant to the Antichrist has uh, power to uh, issue some decrees. And he issues this decree that everyone is to receive this mark. And it is a mark that would either be on their right hand or on the forehead. Now that's that's something we're familiar with already in Revelation, the sense of people being marked, <coughs> because back in chapter 7, God put his mark on the 144,000. Remember, 12,000 from each of the tribes, Jewish people gonna, gonna, going to come to faith in Christ. God's going to put his mark on him, on them. And that mark is going to say, in effect, this person is mine. God, God, God's saying that. And uh, I'm going to protect this person. And, and God certainly will. 144,000 will uh, not be killed by the Antichrist. So we've already had that. That was in chapter 7. Um, in chapter 14, verse 1, the next chapter, chapter 14, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, that's Jesus, and <coughs> with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, we don't know much detail about that, but it is... Uh, there, that the, there is a mark from God on, on those 144,000. What we have here in chapter 13, verse 16, is Satan's counterfeit of that. Satan loves to counterfeit everything that God does. God has his mark on his people, so Satan, through Antichrist, has his mark uh, on his people. Now, this Mark has uh, naturally created a lot of interest. Probably uh, there's more interest on these two verses in Revelation than any other verses in the book because you hear people speculating about what the mark of the beast is and we're going to see about a number and, and so on, 666 and so on. Uh, to kind of understand what's going on here, it helps to know that in the ancient world that John lived in and the people to whom John wrote the book, book of Revelation, <coughs> such marks, which today we would call tattoos or brands, uh, were commonly given to slaves, to soldiers, and to, remem to members of religious cults. And this mark fits in that category of members of a religious cult. It's going to identify those who are worshiping the Antichrist. And uh, it, it's going to identify them as a loyal follower of the Antichrist. Now, I really don't think that this has anything to do with a credit card. Or credit card numbers or cashless society. Uh, you'll, you hear a lot about that when people are talking about prophecy. And they'll come to this and they'll, they'll say that this is saying that each one's going to have their, their credit card number or, or whatever on their forehead. And, and then, and, you know, there's an electronic scanner that scans it and and might be invisible to you, but the scanner can see it, and therefore uh, you don't have to use cash at the grocery store and so on. You'll be able to buy and sell and, um, 
if you don't have that uh, from the Antichrist, uh, you're going to be in big trouble. I don't see this as saying that. Um, I, I, would never, um, I would never insist uh, that my view is, you know, my way or, or, or no one else's, because I don't know that uh, you could ever be dogmatic on it. But stop and think about what this is saying. It's not the person's number. It's not the person's mark. But it is the Antichrist mark. So that it is like a, a tattoo or something that would identify these are the Antichrist loyal followers. And the purpose of the mark is to serve as an ID for those who have given their allegiance to the Antichrist. Now, in verse 17, so that no one could buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. <coughs> so the point is, I think not that there's this individual number, and if you don't get your individual number, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. But it's, if you don't have this identification that you're loyal to the Antichrist, you're going to not be able to sell. No one's going to sell you anything. First of all, it's not going to be allowed by, by the government of the Antichrist and so on. Now he brings up here about the name of the beast, Antichrist that is, or the number of his name. And the name and the number are talking about the very same thing. In English, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But these people were used to the Jewish people, were used to, to Hebrew. Everyone else was used to Greek. And one of the things about both Greek and Hebrew is that they used their alphabet letters for numbers. And they didn't have a separate number one, number two. Number one was the first letter of the alphabet. Number two was the second letter of the alphabet, and so on. And, um, you know, we, we grasp that a little uh, with Roman numerals uh, from Latin. You know, the, the V equals the 5, and the X equals the 10, and the L the 50, and so on. So we kind of have grown up with that concept. Only this idea of Greek and Hebrew is more extensive than that. So since Revelation was originally written in Greek, it's probably referring to the Greek alphabet and its equivalent numbers. So if, <coughs> if you had a Greek word here, you could take uh, the first letter of that Greek word, find out its number equivalent, write that down, take the second letter in, the, in this word, find out its number, write that down, and then when you finish the letters in that word, then add all those numbers, and you have the number equivalent of that word. And that would be what he would be referring to here as this number that is the same as the number uh, of, of the beast. Turning then to verse 18, he says, this calls for wisdom. He's saying this is a, a, a special warning to those who will be alive during the tribulation. Uh, the book of Revelation is written, of course, almost 2,000 years ago. Christians have been studying it ever since. Sometimes it's hard for us to read the book from the perspective that it will be read someday during the tribulation. There are believers, people who will come to faith to know the Lord during the time of the tribulation. Now they were not believers at the time of the rapture or they would have gone up in the rapture. But after the rapture, the gospel is preached by the 144,000 and so on and they believe, trust Christ. They're going to find Bibles. There are going to be plenty of Bibles that are going to be left uh, after, the, after the rapture. And they're going to be reading the Bible. And you can imagine when they get a hold of the book of Revelation, 
it's going to have a whole different impact on them than it's had on us because they're going to be living through these events and they're going to see them. <coughs> so when he says this calls for wisdom, uh, this is a warning to those people who are living during the period of the tribulation. They need to recognize what is happening and uh, know the significance of the number that is associated with the name of the Antichrist when this kicks in and starts being promoted. And so I said, this calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. In other words, add up the numbers connected with the letters of his name. And uh, so ever since the book of Revelation is, was written, Christians have tried to do that with everyone that comes on the scene that someone has a theory that that person might be the Antichrist and that's been going on for a long time and a lot of those people <coughs> obviously are long dead who uh, through the years have been identified as the Antichrist. Um, people in our lifetime who are still living uh, there are some who have been a lot of speculation. I, I especially remember Henry Crick Kissinger. A lot of Christians said, you know, um, he's German. There's that connection with the, uh, with the prophecies of the revived Roman Empire and Daniel. And he's Jewish and so on. I bet you he's the Antichrist. And then they would try to deal with the name Kissinger and see if they could make it come up with 666. I mean, all kinds of things have, have been done like that. Well, the Antichrist is not going to be revealed uh, until after the rapture. Uh, hold on to Revelation and turn to the book of 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 3 to 6. 2 Thessalonians 2. Let no one, 2 verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day, the previous verse says that day is the day of the Lord. The day of judgment, the day when Jesus Christ is coming back. And the day of the Lord uh, takes in the whole period of the tribulation, culminated with the return of Christ. <coughs> that that uh, day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, that's another title for the Antichrist, is revealed <coughs> the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself and so on. And so the point is that... Um, the Antichrist isn't going to be revealed until this last period of time called the Tribulation. It's estimated that um, names of 10,000 people, 10,000 different names, could probably all be, be calculated to come up with 666. And that's where we're going. We haven't gotten that far in the verse. But... Um, this is a warning for those in the tribulation, those believers in the tribulation. It's, it's not going to be something that we can do. There's just no way before he's revealed that we can somehow or other come up with this calculation. We don't have enough information. But the believers during the tribulation will be able to do this uh, with this information. When the time comes, the identity of the Antichrist is going to be very obvious uh, to the believers. So, continuing on in this verse, so, the, who has understanding, calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Man's number, you know, there, there are references in Scripture to some numbers being significant. For instance, the number three because of Trinity. The number 40 uh, just constantly deals with trial and temptation. 
The number seven is God's number. And it's a number of perfection and the perfection of God and so on. Completeness. It's just as a week is complete with seven days. So God is complete. Man is short of God and incomplete. So man's number is six. And so he says, for it is the number of the man and the number is six, six, six. Repeating the number three times emphasizes this is man's number. Have no doubt about it. Now, there's no reason in the world why we as believers today have to be superstitious about the number 666. I know there are Christians who when they're shopping to buy a house, if a house is shown to them and the house number is 666 right away, they will say, no way. We may, that may have everything we want in a house, but we're not going to buy it because its address is 666. Or they're given a phone number by the phone company, 666, and they, they strongly object. That gets into superstition. Um, uh, we don't have to be afraid of the number 666. But this is important information for the people that will be living uh, during the tribulation. And so um, I may have um, burst some bubbles of the typical thinking about the mark of the beast and number 666, but think about it and uh, compare it with what scripture says. We don't have a whole lot about it in scripture. Uh, it's pretty much uh, located here. But um, think about uh, uh, w my viewpoint on that and see what, see what you come up with. Well, let's uh, turn the page to the next page, which is page 66, which is the first notes uh, that are on the table. Oh yeah, so here we go to page 66. Nothing superstitious about that. Okay. So, number nine in our outline was pertaining to the beast, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Now we have number ten. Various announcements. That's in chapter 14. So before we progress with the prophecy of specifics that are going to happen, the next event, next event, next event in prophecy, we have some announcements. Now, uh, this announcement uh, concerns a mighty triumphant group. And, you know, there are many triumphant scenes in the Bible. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in the fiery furnace and the fourth man walking with them and they're unharmed. I think of David and Goliath and, and so many great triumphant scenes, but one of the greatest triumphant scenes in the Bible is in Revelation 14. It's a scene that hasn't happened yet, but it will happen in the future uh, during the period of the tribulation. And so we have A, this first announcement concerning the 144,000. So we get to learn some more about the 144,000. And that's in verses 1 to 5. Now the 144,000 is the most triumphant group of people the world will ever see. You know, there have been other heroes throughout world's history, not just Bible history, but world history. But, but no one more triumphant than these will be at the end of the tribulation. They emerge from the worst world holocaust that there will have ever been. And uh, they're going to survive Satan's persecution of the Jewish people. They're going to survive God's judgments on the earth. We've seen a number of them. Earthquakes and sun darkened and water turned to blood and plagues and you name it. They're going to survive that. Nothing will be able to harm them because the seal of God is upon them. And that seal was put upon them in chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. And because of that, 
They are preserved during this entire period of tribulation. Does that remind you of any others who have been preserved? I think it should remind us of Noah and his family who were preserved from harm during the flood. Everyone else drowned, but not Noah and the family. They were preserved. Rahab, the only citizen of Jericho, who was uh, saved and preserved. The rest of the people of Jericho died when the walls came tumbling down. Um, the, Egypt, the, the Israelis were preserved from the plagues, the ten plagues that came on the Egyptians, uh, just uh, leading up to the Passover. And so that has been something that God has always done. And here he's going to do it on, on this large scale of the 144,000 Jewish believers. So when Jesus returns at the end of the tribulation and stands on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, the 144,000 are going to stand with him in triumph. And they then will enter into the millennial kingdom and they will enter into the millennial kingdom without having died. So that means they will enter into the kingdom with a fully functioning human non-glorified body. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people who enter into the kingdom who have died during the tribulation. And they're going to enter into the kingdom with a glorified body. One of the differences between a glorified body and our pre-glorified body is the pre-glorified body is able to marry and reproduce and so on. Uh, but in the glorified body, Jesus made it clear uh, in, in response to a question that was given to him one time. He said, don't you know the scriptures that uh, we're going to be like the angels, we're not going to be given in marriage and so on. But before the glorified body, we certainly, we are. That is, that is the norm for us. So my point is that there will be some people who enter into the kingdom with a body that is still able to marry and reproduce and have children. And uh, the 144,000 are a good portion of those people. The other part of people that will do that will be there will be some people, just a small group of minority of people who come to faith in Christ during the tribulation who don't get killed during the tribulation, who survive the tribulation. They and the 144,000 will enter into the kingdom with a body that is able to reproduce. That becomes important because later on in the unveiling of prophecy, we learn that during or at the end of the kingdom, there's going to be a rebellion against God. Uh, who are those people that rebel? Those are people who are born during the kingdom. The only way people could be born during the kingdom would be for people to enter into the kingdom with a body that hasn't died yet. And um, most of those who come, who are born during the kingdom will come to salvation, but there will be some who don't and will rebel against God. That becomes, by the way, a, a, a real lesson because some people say, oh, you know, um, the stacks are, are against us for uh, believing in God and trusting in him. I mean, after all, if we lived in a perfect environment, of course uh, we would, but... Uh, these people are going to live in a perfect environment, but because of the sin nature, they still rebel against God. But that's another story uh, that we'll uh, get into. Well, let's look at this, verse 1, chapter 14. And I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. It's the place <coughs> in Jerusalem where the Messiah will reign during the kingdom, during the millennium. It is connected with the prophecy in Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. Let's turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is what we call a messianic psalm. Psalm prophesies the Messiah. 
very, um, very unique in its prophecy of Messiah in, in several ways. It has a conversation between God the Father and God the Son, for instance, very unique. But uh, in, in Psalm 2, verse 6, God the Father says, As for me, I have set my king, my king there is Messiah, Jesus, on Zion, my holy hill. <coughs> so there's this prophecy way back in the time of David that the Messiah is going to reign from Mount Zion. And that's, that's what we're getting into here. <coughs> now, some people look at uh, Revelation 14 here, this prophecy that he sees the 144,000 on Mount Zion. Some people see Mount Zion as the heavenly Mount Zion. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, <coughs> verse 22 to 24 talk about a heavenly Mount Zion, which is certainly true. But if this is the heavenly Mount Zion that's referred to here, the whole point is lost. Um, if this is the heavenly Mount Zion, does that mean the 144,000 died and then are standing before the Lord? Well, that's not the point of the passage. The point of the passage is they survived the tribulation. And they are there when Messiah comes and establishes the kingdom. <coughs> so, <coughs> I don't think it's the heavenly, uh, heavenly Mount Zion. So, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb. That already has been identified earlier in the book of Revelation as referring to Jesus, the Messiah. And with him, 144,000, they're God's property. God marked them. God's taken good care of them. And they've come, come through the most vicious of persecution. And not a one of them has been killed. So these 144,000 who had his name and his father's name <coughs> written on their foreheads. See the connection where we just were in chapter 13 with the mark of the beast. Mark of the beast, name of the beast is on the forehead <coughs> and the right hand of, the, uh, of those who are following him. This is the contrast with that. And they have uh, his name. And of course, he, uh, his name, uh, the, uh, the name of, of our Lord, uh, uh, is not referring uh, as much um, to the name Jesus as to his title, Lord. And that's what uh, is referred to in Philippians 2, that he has given the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. That name that is above every name is the title Lord. And uh, so they, they have this, uh, his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. <coughs> Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters. Now back in chapter 1, verse 15, we met this voice of many waters and learned that that is a description of the voice of Jesus in his glorified state. And many waters, you think of a great waterfall just, just coming and just the massive sound. Uh, Yosemite Falls up in Yosemite and Niagara Falls and so on. And that just speaks of the majesty of, of, of his uh, voice and of his speaking. And so um, they're like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And I heard, uh, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists harping on their harps. Now that's the opposite of many waters. A harp is very gentle and so on. And so this is uh, such a contrast. It's, uh, it's, it's like the contrast between the judgment of God and the love of God. And they are in one person. And that is in the Messiah, the Lord. And verse 3. And they were singing a new song. Several times in the Bible, it refers to God's people singing a new song. And the idea of new is the idea that it's fresh. It's not so much that it's new in time as it's fresh in the sense there's something unique. There's something that there's never been like this before. And they're singing this new song. Scripture tells of nine new songs. 
for God's people, such as in Psalm 33, verse 3. And I think I put these on your notes, did I? Okay. Uh, 40, verse 3, 96, verse 1, 144, verse 9, 149, verse 1, Isaiah 42, 10, and Revelation 5, 9, and here in 14, 3. All these verses talk about God's people having a new song, fresh song. And um, that's going to be true of these because of God's work. They're going to have this fresh new song to sing a pra <coughs> praise to God. And um, so they, they have this new song. And they're singing before the throne and before the four living creatures we met earlier in the book. These are different uh, angels who are called cherubim. And uh, before the elders... The elders we met earlier in the book, that refers to the church, the body of Christ that w was raptured. So that's us who know Christ uh, today. And so um, then it says, no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Now, musical ability doesn't doesn't mean you can learn the song. You learn the song because of your experience of trusting the Lord in the midst of the tribulation. Now, there is no reason given why this song is restricted to the 144,000. <coughs> but I put a, a note on your notes from uh, Henry Morris of a possible explanation. It says, quote, although the words of the song of the 144,000 are not recorded, it surely dwells in part, at least on the great truth, that they had been, quote, redeemed from the earth, unquote. Although in one sense all people have been redeemed from the earth, these could know the meaning of such a theme in a more profound way than others. They had been saved after the rapture, at that time in history, when man's greatest persecutions and God's greatest judgments were on the earth. It was at such a time that they, like Noah in Genesis 6-8, had found grace in the eyes of the Lord and had been separated from all that dwell upon the earth, Revelation 13-8. Not only had they been redeemed spiritually, but precursively, as it were, they had been redeemed from the very curse of the earth, Genesis 3.17, being protected from pain and death by the guarding seal. And that's in, by Henry Morris in the, the Revelation record. Well, turning the page, so that we all stay together, we then come to chapter 14, verse 4, describing these... 144,000. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. So the main point of that <coughs> is that they are standing apart uh, from the sin of their culture. Um, and certainly we see in our day that, you know, there's just such a preponderance of, of uh, sexual um, bombardment with temptation and so on. It's just part of our culture and it's just going to keep on snowballing and getting worse and will be even worse uh, dr during the tribulation than it is today. And yet the Bible has always said that sexual purity is essential to triumphant Christian living. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 22, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 13 and 18 are some of the strong passages on that. And so when we see this here, I, I think it's very natural to take this as literal, that they are are standing firm against this huge temptation of, of that, uh, certainly of that day. But we also have to realize that scripture often uses in figurative language this idea to, of us keeping ourselves from 
being in defiling relationships with the world. And so you can take it both ways. You can take it literal that um, they had kept themselves sexually pure. And I'm sure that's what it means. But it could also have an implication <coughs> broader than that of, of in general terms. They kept themselves from being defiled by the world and uh, the world's culture. So they kept themselves pure in that sense. And then it says, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. I mean, what a great statement that they are so identified with Jesus, the Lamb, that wherever he goes, they want to be there. And uh, I, I, I think we can all identify with that as well. And I hope that's our thought. And um, that we don't want to stray far from him. We want to be like those sheep that stay next to the shepherd as the shepherd leads us uh, into the green pastures. And then it says, They have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. They are the first fruits of redeemed Israel. Because at the end of the tribulation, the, uh, there's, there's going to be a third of the Jewish people left. There is a prophecy in, in Zechariah that two-thirds of the Jewish people are going to be killed in this coming Holocaust. One-third are going to be left. And that one-third, they are going to call on the name of the Lord as their Messiah, as their Savior. And uh, although it's one-third, it's going to be a large group. Well, the first fruits of that are these 144,000. And one of the things about the first fruits in, when it's mentioned in the Bible, uh, first fruits is the idea, it's a guarantee that there's more fruit to come. In the Old Testament, there was the Feast of First Fruits where they brought the first fruit of the harvest to God. And that was on, on faith and belief that, uh, hey, there's going to be some more harvest. We're going to give this to God. God's promised that he's going to give more harvest. And so the 144,000 are guaranteed a promise that that's just the beginning. And that uh, eventually the whole nation of Israel at that time uh, will be saved. And in verse 5, And in their mouth no lie was found. I think that's in contrast to the lifestyle of the non-believers all around them. It's in contrast to the Antichrist and his ways that no lie was found, for they are blameless. Now when it calls them blameless, and numerous times in the New Testament, certain believers are called blameless. And it does not mean sinless. <coughs> but in, instead it means above reproach means living a godly life. Not perfect, but living a godly lifestyle. And above reproach. Uh, you know, for instance, um, if a person's going to be an elder, one of the requirements is that they be above reproach, that uh, even people in the world aren't able to, to point their finger and say, oh, but did you know this guy has done such and such? Now again, that doesn't mean that they're perfect, but it means there's no big block on their name. And that's, uh, that's the picture here. And that they are forgiven, they're cleansed, and they're acting differently than the world. So no lie was found, for they are blameless. That brings us to B, uh, concerning uh, the everlasting gospel. So here, here's an announcement concerning the everlasting gospel. And that's in verse 6. Then I saw another angel. That would be another among the many angels that we have seen in Revelation. Angel is one of the more common words in Revelation because we meet a lot of them. Now this is the first of three angels that we're going to meet in verses 6 through 11. And each of these angels has a message from God. 
which shouldn't surprise us because the word angel does mean messenger. And these three messages are anticipating the final judgment that's coming in the form of the seventh trumpet. And that seventh trumpet, when we get there, like the seventh seal, is actually going to be made up of seven. It's going to be the seven bowls of wrath, uh, which are going to be these final judgments uh, on the face of the earth. But before those come, God is graciously, off, graciously offering sinners another opportunity to repent before unleashing the final judgments. So this is the first of those three angels, and this angel preaches the gospel. The second angel is going to pronounce judgment, and the third is going to describe the coming damnation. So this first one, uh, offering the gospel, it says, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel. Now it's interesting that in our day, the age of grace that we live in now, age of the church, angels are not entrusted with giving the message of the gospel. We are entrusted with giving that. Uh, sometimes we wish angels could do it and would do it. We think that might make our job a little easier. But God wants us to be personally involved in communicating with others. But here, uh, during the tribulation, angels are entrusted with the gospel. And of course, the gospel means good news. And this is the eternal gospel in that it never changes. It is the same good news that there has been from the time of Adam's sin all the way uh, until now. So he has an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Now the 144,000 have been proclaiming that gospel, but now this angel gets to do it. And this is part of the fulfillment of a prophecy that Jesus made in Matthew 24, verse 14. Why don't we turn there? Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24 is a chapter of a prophecy by Jesus shortly before he went to the cross. 24 and 25 are called the Olivet Discourse. It's a message Jesus gave on the Mount of Olives. It has everything in it has to do with prophecy. Most, much of it, especially in chapter 24, has to do with the tribulation period. And uh, it's interesting that Jesus gave this prophecy in Matthew 24, verse 14. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Sometimes you will hear people uh, exhorting Christians, got to get the gospel out, because Jesus said when we get the gospel out, uh, then he will come. That is kind of taking out of context what Jesus said here. He's, he, he, the Lord will come at the rapture, and there's no, no prophecy connected. Well, I won't come into, in the rapture until you take the gospel everywhere. It's just not there. But what is there is <coughs> that in that last period of the tribulation, the gospel will get to every part of the world. 144,000 are going to be part of it. This angel is going to be part of it. So turning back to Matthew <coughs> chapter 14, so the... Um, it goes to all people, verse 7, and he said with a loud voice, fear God. And uh, fear has to do the, with the idea of reverence, realize he is God. The angel is calling on people to change their allegiance from allegiance to the Antichrist to allegiance to God and give him glory because the root of man's rebellion is to not give God's glory, God glory, but give it to themselves and to people like the Antichrist. 
and do this because the hour of his judgment has come. The final judgment leading up to the second coming is about here. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. So this is the God of creation. This is the God who uh, put uh, the mountains here and the waterfalls and the seas and everything else. <coughs> and he did it uh, for his glory. And so he says, therefore, uh, this message goes out during the tribulation. Turn to him. Repent and turn to him. Now the next page begins with chapter 14, verse 8. But our time is just about up, so I think we will uh, stop here and uh, continue next week. And... Uh, we're moving right along. We are uh, coming to the great climax uh, pretty soon. Well, let's come to God in prayer. Father, how we do thank you for being able to study Revelation tonight. And we pray that uh, you would just um, cause us to chew over these things in our mind and to compare Scripture with Scripture to see if these things are so. And, um, Lord, that we would just love you and praise you and serve you as a result of knowing more of your plan in the book of Revelation. And so we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.